Good afternoon and welcome to this week's McGill Alumni Webcast. My name is Derek Kassoff, Managing Director of Communications at McGill's Office of University Advancement. For some people, the COVID-19 pandemic has spent more time in the kitchen, cooking, baking, and trying new recipes. Some have used this opportunity to rethink how they eat and have even shed a few pounds in the process. For others, maybe not so much. And almost all of us have had to think a little more about the safety of the food we bring into our homes and whether our supermarkets might run low on some of our favorite products. Any way you look at it, this pandemic has changed our relationship with food. It's Thursday, May 28th, and this is From Farm to Fork, how the pandemic is affecting our food, our food supply, and our farmers. This week's McGill Alumni Webcast. And who better to help us sort through all of this information than two professors from McGill's Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, housed on our beautiful McDonald campus in St. Anne de Bellevue. Let me introduce them. Jennifer Ronholm is an assistant professor in the faculty, a World Economic Forum Young Scientist, and the 2020 recipient of the McDonald Campus Award for Teaching Excellence. Welcome, Professor Ronholm. And we have with us Pascal Theriot, who is an agricultural economist, a faculty lecturer in the Department of Farm Management and Technology, Director of Community Relations at, McDon at McGill's Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, and Vice President of L'Ordre des Agronomes du Québec. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for joining us today. So before we jump into the questions around food <coughs> safety and food supplies during this COVID-19 pandemic, I'd like to get to know a little bit more about each of your areas of work. Uh, Professor Ronholm, perhaps we'll start with you. So if I understand correctly, you spend much of your days working with the bacteria, fungi, and viruses that impact the quality of our food and pose potential dangers to our health. Can you tell us a little bit more about your research and what a day in the life looks like for a food bacteriologist? <laughs> sure, um, thank you for having me. Um, <laughs> so my primary interest is in providing good alternatives to antibiotics uh, for farmers. So if I can give you a bit of history here, in the 1930s, we actually discovered that if we feed agricultural animals antibiotics, they both grow faster and they remain healthier at higher densities. And after this discovery, um, the use of antibiotics in agriculture proliferated a lot. Um, right now, by weight, 80% of the antibody antibiotics we make actually get used in food production as opposed to human medicine. Um, and this has no doubt led to a rise in antibiotic resistance in clinical practice. So the argument could be made and has been made a lot of times that you could just ban antibiotics from agricultural use. But you can't really without drastically uh, affecting both farm productivity and animal welfare. So my lab works under the hypothesis that we could make the microbiome of our agricultural animals more healthy so that they both resist disease better and grow faster. So everyone's probably heard of the microbiome. It's on the Dove commercials now. Um, and everyone knows that you have this big population of bacteria living in and on you. When these bacteria get sick, when your population gets sick, you become more prone to infection. Um, Clostridium difficile is probably the archetypal um, uh, example of a disease that you get when you have an unhealthy microbiome. And farm animals aren't really different in this respect. If we can make these populations more healthy, we might be able to get more bang for our buck. Um, in terms of a typical day, it starts with a lot of coffee stop at the farm and I check on both my animals and the people feeding my animals and see that everything's going okay if there's any problems and I go into my lab. Most of my work is done at the DNA or genetic level. So most of my students spend all of their time um, extracting bacterial DNA from animal poop. So I go into my lab and I see who's working on which samples and make a bit of fun of them because it usually smells pretty bad in there. Um, but after that, I go and I spend most of my time writing grants to make sure we have enough money to do this work because it's very expensive work. And my lab can also generate 20 to 30 gigs of DNA sequence data in a good week. So I usually spend a lot of time coding as well because a human can't go through 20 gigs of data. And that's what my days are like. Great. And I think if we had any uh, concerns about losing any of the audience uh, to lunchtime, we may have just allayed those concerns. <laughs> so thanks for that very vivid description. But I'm just curious, I'm actually curious though, how does one typically wind up with a career such as yours? Like at what stage in your life did you decide that you wanted to devote your, devote your career to the study of bacteria and, and foodborne illnesses? Uh, it's, 
it's actually kind of a funny story. When I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, the movie Outbreak came out, the one with Do Donald uh, Sutherland and Dustin Hoffman. And I love that movie. I think I watched it a thousand times. I haven't seen it in years, but I could still probably recite it. And like, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to chase pathogens, but uh, I ended up working on foodborne pathogens and didn't work for you, Sam, but it all worked out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds like a great story, nevertheless. And I'm sure with the with the coronavirus top of mind for so many people, I know you've become a bit of a, a go-to resource and a minor media celebrity with lots to explain about microbes and food safety. And we're anxious to hear more about that. But before we do that, let's uh, get to know our second panelist a little bit uh, better, uh, Pascal Theriot. So, uh, Professor Theriot, I guess I'm curious, when the world is not completely consumed by a global pandemic as we are now, what does an agricultural economist spend his days doing? And what sorts of problems keep you up at night? Well, m most of my days are devoted to teaching the future crop of farmers. And uh, more specifically, of course, I, I teach uh, farm business management courses, whether it's accounting, uh, budgeting, finance, entrepreneurship. Because uh, over the years, farming has become more and more complicated. Margins have got narrower for farmers. So we're looking at how you optimize your farm operation, how you make the proper changes in order to increase profitability and make sure that your business will last through time. And uh, while I do look at food policies, I have a very keen interest in agricultural marketing and consumer behavior. So uh, let's face it, if you ever see me in a grocery store and I just stare at your grocery cart, I'm probably judging you right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, did you, it's an interesting career choice as well. Did you grow up on a farm as well um, or near farms or? Well, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> I often tell my students, well, on, on one hand, my dad's been in the agri-food marketing sector most of his life, and then my mom's an accountant, and that's what happened. <laughs> well, there you go. So no, uh, no Hollywood movie to get you on that career. You relied on your parents. <laughs> Great. So let's start the discussion, um, I guess, maybe with the question that is probably top of mind for most people who are tuning in today, uh, and one that was, in fact, reflected in many of the questions that we received from our alumni community this week. Uh, so, Professor Ronald, I'll turn it to you first. Can we catch the coronavirus from the foods that we eat? Um, it's a great question. Um, probably not. Um, I'm sure that the risk is very, very, very low, um, but I can't say that it's not absolutely not theoretically possible. So let me take you through the thinking. Um, for you to become infected with coronavirus, the virus has to be alive at minimum on the food when you eat it. Viruses start dying the second they leave the host, so it can't multiply on the food. Um, some viruses survive very, very well in food. And if you think about viruses and infections that we know you can get from food, most people will probably recognize them. Hepatitis A virus, norovirus, rotavirus, and back in the day, polio virus could also survive in food very well. So what these viruses that do survive very well have in common is that they're all non-enveloped viruses. COVID-19 is an enveloped virus. Um, that means it's covered in proteins and lipids. And to cause a human infection, this envelope has to be mostly intact. Uh, it's very fragile in the environment, so it probably breaks down relatively quickly on food. So as soon as someone sneezes on an apple, the virus starts dying as soon as it hits that apple. The death is probably fairly rapid, but I can't put an exact number on how long COVID-19 can survive on an apple. Um, the other thing to think about here that is a minor concern for me is that there are some studies showing that if you put a lot of influenza virus in food and immediately feed it to an animal, those animals seem to be able to become sick. That's not directly uh, applicable to your grocery shopping experiment experience because it's not that direct feeding and virus concentrations wouldn't be this high. So I can't say a hundred percent it would never happen, but the risks are extremely low. Okay. So that said though, are you surprised at all by how much concern and anxiety there is around food contamination with regards to COVID-19? And, and from your perspective, is this perhaps at least a good sign that people are paying attention to the correlation between the foods we ingest and our health and well-being? Yeah, I'm not surprised how worried people are. It's, it's a scary virus and we know so little about it, but like the chances of it getting, you getting an infection from your food are so low that like if you have a hundred things to worry about this week, that shouldn't really be one of them. 
Um, if mm -hmm. it is kind of a good thing that people are paying attention to their food more, um, most people don't know, but one in eight people in Canada get a foodborne infection every year. So like statistically every eight years, you're going to have one. Most of the time we call these food poisoning and don't really worry about what causes it. But sometimes these foodborne infections are fatal and they represent like a major decrease in productivity for our workforce and a major burden on our hospital. So if we can get people doing safer grocery stop shopping, having better hygiene in their kitchens, I mean, that, that is a good thing. Mm -hmm. So putting coronavirus aside for, for an instant, what are the ways in which food is at risk of being contaminated in a grocery store or other settings? And, and are there some foods that can be more prone to being contaminated than others? That's a great question as well. Um, so in terms of a foodborne illness, a lot of them originate on the farms. So meat products tend to have a lot of them, but vegetable products are actually accelerating in the amount of foodborne illnesses they cause every year. I think we can all remember in the last couple of years, there's been several romaine lettuce uh, scares and outbreaks. Um, Grocery stores are actually very good at not having cross-contamination. Occasionally, you'll see uh, listeria outbreaks from cross-contamination of meat products in a deli counter, but this is really, really rare. Okay. So getting back to the current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic, are there any sort of rules or back best practices that you would suggest people follow when they're out shopping for groceries? And does this include things like wearing face masks or gloves or just paying attention to particular things above and beyond the kind of physical distancing that we're reminded about over and over? Well, yeah, I, I mean, I'll restate that the physical distancing in the grocery stores is really important. If you're going to get coronavirus grocery shopping, it's probably from another patron as a opposed to the food. Um, I think it's a really good idea to wash your hands before you go into the grocery store. It's a really good idea to wash your hands when you leave. Um, in terms of masks, I think masks are a great idea. I wear a mask to the grocery store and I would encourage everyone else to do it. Um, but <laughs> based on my Facebook page, there's a lot of skepticism about whether masks actually work or not. So I'm going to take a minute or two if it's okay and just talk to like some skeptics out there. I don't think that there is empirical evidence showing that masks, non-medical grade masks, are completely effective against coronavirus. And I don't think for a while that there's going to be. I mean, from an empirical evidence perspective, it would be great to put a bunch of people wearing non-medical -medi grade masks in a room with a bunch of people who have COVID-19 and see who gets sick. But scientists have ethics and scientists are crazy. So we're obviously not going to do that. So we're not going to get this solid empirical evidence at this moment in time that masks work. But if you look at it this way, um, COVID-19 is best spread through respiratory droplets. So when I sneeze or cough or breathe or talk, I'm spreading these droplets. We know that masks are pretty good at keeping these droplets to yourself. So if I'm wearing a mask, I'm probably a lot less able to spread the virus. And if less people are spreading it, then less people are going to get it. And maybe we'll get through this a little faster. So does a non-medical grade 100% obliterate the need for social distancing and keep the virus contained? No, probably not. But to me, all the math works out that if we do wear these masks in public, everyone will be a little healthier. Um, gloves are a different story. I don't think it's a good idea to wear gloves to the grocery store. Um, gloves need to be used in a special way in an appropriate way to be an effective infection um, control mechanism. Um, when we use them in the lab, we change them often. When they're used in hospitals, they're changed between patients. And there's not a good way to do that in the grocery store. You're not going to, you know, shop for your lettuce and change them and then go shop for your canned goods and change them again. And you also, I wouldn't expect people to not wear the same mask. Someone would go to get their mail and then go grocery shopping and wear the same gloves in all these different locations, spreading the contamination more. It's just a much better idea to wash your hands before you go in and wash your hands when you leave. Mm -hmm. Great. So if I took one, I think, piece of advice from that, I mean, there's a lot of good information there. It's that mm -hmm. if you are going to catch coronavirus grocery shopping, it will most likely be from 
a fellow shopper and not from a banana or an apple that you might purchase. So, um, yes. Professor Terrio, I, I know you're sort of anxiously waiting to jump in, and I will get to you. I've got a whole bunch of questions around food supply, but I had a couple of questions that came in from alumni, very specific to what we've just talked about. So, if it's okay with you, I'm just going to stick with Professor Ronald for a couple of minutes more just to get through. Um, there were sort of two sets of questions, I guess. Um, so the first actually came in from Dr. Karsten Steinhauer. He actually sent in two questions. Uh, so he writes, my spouse and I tend to wash or rinse with warm water, virtually all the items right after we brought them home from vegetables to milk containers. Recent news of what the actual risks of coronavirus contamination are seem quite inconsistent. Based on recent scientific evidence, what are the experts' recommendations in May, 2020? Okay, that's a good question. Um, like I probably already said, um, the risks of getting it from touching these packaging items are really, really low. That being said, I don't really see anything wrong with what Dr. Steinhauer is doing. He's washing it in water. That's you know the only problem is that it's time consuming and he can spend his time all he wants. Um, but I think some of the problems are over cleaning. So a lot of people are using Lysol or other really intense chemicals to disinfect their groceries. And as a result of that, in some jurisdictions, calls to poison control have gone up 100%. And in some jurisdictions, they've gone up 300%. Um, so it's a danger to you to be using a lot of these products that you're not used to using and know the proper ways of using on your groceries for very small benefit. And as a, at the societal level, what we're doing by overcleaning to this extent without any benefit is breeding more um, antimicrobial resistant bugs. So it's just not a good idea um, to use intense chemicals during this. The downside far outweighs, uh, outweighs the upside. Okay, great, great advice there. And his second question was, I, we talked about this a little bit, but uh, he was wondering if there are any foods that one should either avoid entirely or treat with particular care during this pandemic? I don't think so. I think the food supply is basically as safe as it ever is. Okay, great. So the last question or for, for this, and then we'll move to, to you, Professor Terrio. Um, this one comes in from Shelley Belson. So she actually sent in two questions as well, but we'll address the first one now and, and maybe get to the second one later because it's specific to fruits and vegetables. So she writes that her family is putting their fruits and vegetables in quarantine for three days at room temperature. And that this seems to work for some fruits and veggies, but others don't appear safe to eat, having been stored at room temperature for so long. Is this three-day quarantine a good idea for those fruits and vegetables uh, that can tolerate it? Or are there better or safer ideas that you can suggest? I would really just suggest washing your fruit and veggies in warm running water. Wash them a couple times with your hand, get the surface contamination off, and it's fine. Um, and I would also remind everyone that fruit and vegetables do naturally have bacteria and molds on their surfaces, which eventually lead to spoilage. And some of the molds that grow on our fruit and vegetables actually produce some pretty crazy, dangerous toxins. So that extra time that you're leaving these things, if you are getting mold growth, no, the food's no longer safe to eat. So just bring them in, give them a wash, and uh, it'll be fine. Okay, great. Um, so I do want to get back to some of the issues around food safety, but let's let's turn to Professor Terrio now, and thank you for being so patient. Um, I want to talk a little bit about food supply as well. Um, so to be honest, you know, in our household, uh, I leave most of the grocery shopping to my wife, who's great at that. <laughs> uh, but I did join her on a trip to our local Costco this past weekend, and I, I noticed several half-empty shelves, particularly fruits and vegetables, dairy products, and, and a little bit in the meat section. Um, so I guess my first question to you, Professor Terrio, is how concerned should North Americans be right now about the supply of food? Well, I, I don't believe there's any reason why we should be worried about the, the medium or long term supply of food. Uh, what we might see is that some prices might be going up because we had some supply disruption because of COVID-19. But what we're seeing more and more is that things are getting back to normal. Indeed, in the first days, uh, we had lots of empty shelves. And as I told the students while I was teaching online, you know, for every truckload of toilet paper you have to carry, it's a truckload of food products you can't have. And there's only so many trucks that can be on the road at once. So the, I think the grocery chains were trying to answer to people's short-term demand. And as it's getting better now, we see shelves repacking themselves and we're 
closely going back to normal. And because people's consumption habits are going back to normal too, people were stocking on food items that grocery stores weren't even aware they had. I think at, at, in some cases, I did talk to my local grocer and she said, well, I'm running out of products that I never run out of because some people have started stocking on specific items that I rarely order because it takes a while to get through. And so they're not in my next three orders to come in because, well, I should not have needed them from one week to another. What sort of products are you talking about that people are are, are trying to get their hands on now? Uh, well, uh, I remember early on in March, you had some uh, canned tomatoes, for example, where, where she knew that if she got so many cases of canned tomatoes, she could last a month and a month or a month and a half. So she never had any extra orders put in she managed to run out in a week. So she had a hard time being able to, to keep up and to restock her store because there, there's limited inventory space, there's limited shelf space. And what it brought us to see is that our food system is highly efficient, but it's highly efficient as long as everything runs smoothly. Mm -hmm. And I guess the consumers have to play their part and, and stick to the patterns we're used to. But let's talk a little bit about the food processing plants. Uh, I know here in Canada and as well in the United States, uh, we're hearing stories of some of these plants that need to shut down or, or go offline, uh, specifically because of COVID-19 outbreaks in their facilities. Um, and we've heard stories that some of our favorite fast food restaurants are running out of products like hamburgers. So how much pressure is the pandemic placing on the ability to get beef, pork and poultry onto store shelves? And what should we be most concerned about there moving forward? Well, the, as I just said, the, the chain's highly efficient from the farmer all the way to the retail store. What we've seen is that because over the years we've worked on having an agri-food system that's focused on low cost, we built bigger and bigger packing plants, bigger and bigger slaughterhouses that are highly efficient. And as you get them bigger and more efficient, you need less of them. So from the moment you have one plant that shuts down, it creates a much bigger wave on the whole system. Uh, we saw it specifically in the hog sector, where you still had some pork at the grocery store. You had plenty of hogs on hog farms. And in between, like in Quebec, we had a few plants that had to shut down because some employees got contaminated with COVID-19. And when they did restart, they only could restart at a slower pace because they did not have as many employees out there. So ultimately, it did create a shock. We're seeing it slowly again starting to go back to normal, if we can call it normal. But uh, of, of course, one way around is to have multiple smaller slaughterhouse, multiple smaller packing plants. But uh, as you get smaller, sometimes you lose some efficiency measures, and that might and that will probably drive up the cost because if you need one inspector on a big plant, you need one inspector on a small plant, if you need 10 small plants, well, you now need 10 inspectors to inspect and have all those high fixed costs split over more and more smaller plants than one big plant. Mm -hmm. So the most of these, these sort of shortages, the, are they kind of regional phenomena? So like, for example, when the Cargill plant in South Shore Montreal went down, would that affect just the Montreal, Quebec area? Can they bring in you know other products quickly from other parts of the country? How, 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 how good is the system sort of nationally able to sort of jump in and help regional uh, regional problems? Well, we have a, a, a good number of federally inspected plants. So from the moment you deal with federal inspected plants, you can move food, meat products from one province to another. But we also have smaller plants that are provincially inspected. And when you get with provincially inspected plants, it's much more difficult to be able to move the product in between provinces. Uh, the, the South Shore plant was a Cargill plant. It was a, a further processing plant. They were not actually slaughtering there. And well, it, it did shut down, not for too long, thankfully, but as it was fairly inspected, you were able to get products from elsewhere in the country. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to just ask you a little bit as well about the situation on Canada's farms. Um, I know that you know, farmers here in Quebec and, and elsewhere in, in Canada rely heavily on laborers often brought in from Mexico and, and Central America. So I'm wondering, are these laborers, have they still been able to travel to Canada given the pandemic and, and be here for the growing and, and the harvest seasons? And what are labor disruptions? What, what might they mean for our supply and, and prices of fresh fruits and vegetables? Well, we have foreign labor, mostly on fruit and vegetable farms. 
so far, it seems that 50 to 60 percent of the expected labor force is present right now in Canada. Uh, we've seen government programs trying to motivate people to go work on farms. Uh, from what I've heard from farmers, not many farmers are too keen on that idea. And it's not because they, they don't trust the labor force. It's more that they are afraid that should the economy start back again and people would like to go back to their real jobs, well, they'd be stuck with crops in the field when nobody could harvest those crops. Uh, you had just last week one example of a large strawberry producer on Ile d'Orléans that actually chartered a plane himself, paid $160,000 to get his workers because he needed the workers. He needs roughly 200 foreign workers a year to plant and harvest his strawberries, his raspberries, and his sweet potatoes. So he, he took it about himself to actually get the plane and go get them. And there were no issues getting them into the country with, with border closures and quarantines and such? Well, the temporary workers still have to be quarantined. And with larger farmers, it, it's probably easier because they have the capacity or the financial capacity to deal with that quarantine. But from the moment you bring them to Canada, they still have to get paid during their two weeks of quarantine, even though they cannot work. And you have to house them respecting social distancing, which goes completely against the housing system we have for temporary workers on, on their normal circumstances. So it does increase the cost of having those temporary workers. but we're out of the plane B right now. Mm -hmm. Now, just getting back to the, the farm piece again. So I read recently that in a typical year, about 5% of Canada's independent family owned farms will go bankrupt. Um, and that there's a concern that this year, because of the pandemic, we could see that number climb much higher, uh, maybe even doubling to 10%. Do you share those concerns? And, and why is an independent farm sector so important for consumers in the grocery stores? Well, I have some concerns because uh, the, 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 at the farm level, margins are extremely slim. So if the farms were not in a, in a good financial situation or a good financial health, they will probably find it extremely difficult to get through that crisis. And if, even with production sectors that are traditionally uh, well served, everything under supply management, we've seen that the egg producers had to cut their production. We've heard about milk being dumped because there was nowhere to get that milk. And even chicken producers had to reduce their quality to be produced. Well, farmers don't get paid for products that don't get sold. So it, it, it does impact their revenues. Okay. Now, is there a role for governments to play here? And, and have we seen the federal or provincial governments come to the rescue in any way, of uh, the rescue of farmers and other food producers in any meaningful way during the pandemic? Well, we have seen the federal government offer financial help for farmers that needed to get foreign laborers in to help subsidize the cost of uh, the quarantine. Uh, we have some agri-stability programs at the federal level to help farmers also. Uh, the, the biggest program we've heard about in Quebec was the one where they were giving an incentive for people to go work on farms. That's a good system as long as we have people actually willing to go work on farms because there's, ex it's an extremely physical and hard job. And it, it's not by any mean a, a fun job because you might like the outdoors, but the outdoors gets a bit long after days of 12, 14 hours. <laughs> yeah, and for those of you who are not in Montreal watching this, it was 36 degrees Celsius here yesterday in, in southern Quebec, so I can imagine what it was like on the farms. Um, so one, one final question on this. I know it's a, it is obviously a very complex question. There's a lot of, of, of factors, but as consumers in the cities, um, should we expect to see a rise in prices over the next few months as this pandemic continues? And what sort of rise what might that be if there is one? Oh, it, it, it is possible that we will see a rise. Uh, most Western economies, we tend to eat more processed food, so less raw products directly from the farm. So the, the food component it, it is built uh, in a more important matter with uh, labor, transportation, energy cost. And so if it costs more to process the food, well, that increase in cost will be sent toward the consumer because farmers have a very, very low margin. The processors are highly efficient with usually not so big margins and the retailers often have negative margins on some products. So ultimately the consumer will pay for 
all those increased measures we have to take to ensure that our food system remains safe. Because we do have one of the safest, if not the safest food system in the world. That we have to remember that we're pretty lucky in Canada about that. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. So let's turn our attention for a moment to the restaurant industry or, or what's left of it, I guess. Um, so we've seen many restaurants stay open through the pandemic by offering takeout and delivery service. Professor Ronholm, I'll turn it back to you. Um, so is it generally safe to order takeout food? Um, and, and what if, you know, the chef who tossed the pizza dough or made the hamburger for us is COVID-19 positive? Is there any risk there of cross-contamination and or precautions that consumers might want to think about to protect themselves? That's a good question again. Um, I think the evidence at this point indicates that takeout food is fairly safe. I don't, to my knowledge, as of today, we haven't seen a case of COVID-19 that can do, be defini definitively linked to takeout food or something like that. So I think it's very safe. If the chef cooking the food had COVID-19, I think we'd all be a little bit worried about eating it. But at the same time, we have to remember that as soon as the chef coughs on the pizza dough, the virus starts dying. Cooking definitely kills the virus. Um, we don't know how long it would survive on the pizza if he coughed on it before he put it on the box, but it's probably a very short time. Um, and then when you put the food in your mouth, having the virus go into your mouth and into your gastrointestinal tract, if there is a pathway for infection there, it's not a good pathway. It's hard if it can do it to infect you that way. What's much a much easier pathway of infection is human to human droplet. So it, being the other chef in the kitchen is a huge danger. Eating the pizza is a very, very small danger. That being said, there are lots of foodborne infections and intoxications that can easily be spread from cook to restaurant pat patron. So the best advice and the advice that's true before the pandemic and will be true after is you, have, you shouldn't have a cook with an acute illness. Um, because it could be spread through the food chain if it's something uh, like salmonella typhi. You don't want your sick cook cooking. Mm -hmm. So here's a, the second question from Shelley uh, Belson, uh, which I think is maybe an, a good time to bring it in as a follow-up here. So she's asking specifically about uh, when eating meals ordered in from restaurants, for how long and at what temperature should we set the oven when reheating our food? So is that a precaution we should be considering, um, sort of doing our own reheating, even if the food is warm when we get home with it? Um, you could. There's nothing wrong with reheating your food. Um, in terms of other foodborne pathogens, the danger zone for takeout food or any food is when it's between 4 and 60 degrees Celsius. So if you have food in that temperature range, that's the temperature range at which bacterial pathogens can be growing and proliferating and producing toxins to make you sick. So you never want to have your food at that temperature for very long. Um, if you are going to reheat uh, takeout food, you want to make sure that the internal temperature of that food is above 74 degrees Celsius. So it's not a bad idea. Go buy a digital thermometer, put it in your oven, make sure it hits that 74 mark right in the middle before you eat it again. And that'll protect you from other bacterial pathogens like Bacillus cereus or Clostridium perfringens, as well as COVID-19. Um, but I will also just remind people that bacteria can sometimes produce toxins that are heat stable. So if you do temperature abuse, take out food for a long time, things like Salmonella aureus that might be on the cook's hands can grow in that food and produce a toxin that's not destroyed by reheating. So you should never be leaving these foods at room temperature for a long time, thinking that the COVID-19 is going to die because you've left them at room temperature for a while. Okay, great advice there. Uh, Professor Theriot, let me turn it back to you now in terms of the... the, the ones from the subject of restaurants. And I'm wondering from an agroeconomic uh, perspective, what has the temporary closing of so many restaurants meant, um, first of all, for farmers and other food suppliers? Um, so, I mean, what sort of market is there for these higher end products, uh, like rich butters and creams, uh, expensive cuts of beef, seafood, if they don't have restaurants to sell them to anymore, are they still producing these foods and, and what is happening to them right now? Well, if we go back to, Two months ago, we, we saw in the news that uh, dairy farmers in Quebec had to dump milk. Well, 30 to 35% of the milk that is produced 
uh, is going toward the restaurant sector and the hotel sector. It's mostly the heavy cream and the butter, as you mentioned. Uh, the farmers have been able to adjust with the packing plant, thanks to our supply management system. And uh, th they've been able to process that milk into cheese for food banks. Ooh. Now, what we see a lot in the meat sector, we have some cuts that are harder to find in the, in, in the meat section, but we, we see in our flyers, if you look at our grocery flyers these days, some meat that is extremely cheap. Uh, we see good deals on veal cuts right now. Veal is tragically consuming in restaurants. As animals are keep growing, we are still slaughtering them and we're just sending them through the grocery chains uh, for beef cuts. Uh, on any beef carcass, there's so, a given percentage that goes toward each cut because, well, that, that's a, a full body. So usually 35-ish percent goes toward ground beef. But if you look at ribs, if you look at loins, it's 25% of the animal. And the uh, T-bones, uh, ribeye, rib steaks, they're traditional cuts that go toward the restaurant sector. So if you cannot send them in the restaurant industry or to hotels, well, they will end up at the grocery store. And in the last month or so, there has not been a week where one of the chain did not have some rib steaks at really low prices for, for, for the quality of meat that you can get. Mm -hmm. So from a consumer's perspective, like you said, I guess you're now able to shop for these more expensive cuts at a, a reduced price. You, you can, and you have to remember that uh, the, the restaurant takeout has been growing a lot through the different programs such as uh, Skip It or Uber Eat, but we see it more with chicken. It's easier with some meat products than it is with steaks. I'm pretty sure that people will not think about ordering a steak through Uber Eat, for example, just because it, it's more heat sensitive. Uh, you can cook and reheat chicken more easily than you can with a steak or even with pork, which will turn much harder. We lose some of its qualities easier if you try to reheat it. Mm -hmm. Are you noticing any like major shifts in, in just eating habits uh, or food consumption habits during the pandemic that people are, are switching to different kinds of food? Well, we're, we're definitely eating more at home. And I think that many families in Canada are now at the point where they're going to try something else just because they get tired of having to eat at home all the time. And it, we, we went from eating one and a half meal per day at home to pretty much eating all our meals at home. So even in my household, at some point, you just go grocery shopping and buy something new just because, well, might as well try it. That's where we're at right now. We can't keep cycling the same food over and over again mm -hmm. each and every week. Right. And I guess on the restaurant or takeout uh, side, I think what I'm noticing in, in my own sort of experience and, and friends as well, that there was a lot of fear, I think, in the first two, three weeks of the pandemic and people kind of dipped their toe in and would order a pizza. And now with some of the safety concerns being allayed by Professor Ronholm and others, people are maybe now supporting the kind of restaurants that are offering the takeout a bit more, I guess you would argue, right? Yes, and, and restaurants have not been focusing on price, on their menu, or on quality. The, the restaurant ads you see these days are strictly about food safety and how their delivery people are taking all the proper measures to make sure that the food is safe. So that's right. a shift. That, yeah, that's very interesting. Um, and I actually had a question later on, but maybe I'll get to it now for you, Professor Ron Holm. Um, in terms of the food safety piece, so, I mean, with so much focus on, on COVID-19 right now, uh, are you at all concerned that guidelines and best practices designed to protect us from other foodborne illnesses like salmonella, novavirus, um, are at risk of becoming disregarded or not adhered to astringently? Or would you argue that, in fact, people are being more careful across the board because of the coronavirus that, that we're, 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 our foods will be that much safer? Yeah. Um, so like Pascal said a little earlier, we have one of the safest food supplies in the world. I know I talk about foodborne pathogens a lot, but our numbers in Canada are like so low compared to other places. Um, and I, I haven't seen any evidence that our inspection system has been suffering. We won't have the numbers um, for how many foodborne infections there were this year until much later. But I, I think if anything, the food supply is as safe or safer than it has ever been at this moment in time. Okay, great. So we have a little bit of time left. We have a few more questions that came in from alumni. So let me just get to them. Uh, the first one actually it sticks with this issue of food safety. So I'll stick with you, Professor Ronholm. This one came from Cindy Leather. 
Uh, she wants to know um, whether raw, fresh, or frozen meat can carry the COVID-19 virus to us if the workers are unknowingly positive for the virus. And we probably talked touch on this a little bit, but uh, what's this perspective in terms of meat, raw, fresh, frozen? Um, it's the only thing there, like I've said several times, the virus starts dying immediately and it takes a long time for meat to get from a slaughterhouse to your table. So in that time, there's a really good chance that all the virus is dead if it was ever there. Um, in addition, meat, should be cooked and meat should be cooked to a proper internal temperature. Uh, cooking would completely obliterate any virus if there was any remaining. Um, so coronavirus coming on meat that you're cooking is not an issue. Okay, great, thank you. So here's a couple more questions, a bit broader in scope. Um, maybe, I guess I'll, I'll turn this one to you, uh, Professor Terrio. This one comes from Dominique Argento. So he wrote, um, do we have the technological know-how to grow most of our food locally? And if this was a national goal, how big an economic penalty would we suffer? Would prices for locally grown food be much higher? And do we know the elasticity of consumer prices? That's a very good question, a very broad question, but a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, do we have the technological know-how to grow our food locally? Yes, we do. Uh, Canada is a net exporter of food. We're one of the largest food exporters in the world. Now. Is it realistic to think that tomorrow morning we could become self-sufficient in food? Probably not. Over the last 30, 40 years, the food diversity we've had a chance to have in Canada has been expanding year after year. So as a consumer or as consumers, are we ready to let go bananas and avocado and mango? For many people, I, I think the answer is no. I see Jennifer smiling right now, and I'm, she's part of the no club. I know. I, I like my <laughs> avocados. <laughs> so, and, and could we technologically produce avocados in Canada? Well, probably so. Is it economically feasible? Likely not. We see right now problems, and we hear about uh, farms or rural areas not being able to get high-speed internet. We have some rural areas that don't even have the proper electrical infrastructure to think about building greenhouses that would be efficient enough to grow food that we don't usually grow here. Now, th there was part of the question was about elasticities of food. Uh, well, elasticity is an economic concept that look at how much quantity will vary, will vary when you change the price of, of a food item. Uh, in Canada, most food, if not all food, is known as being inelastic. It means that when you change the price of food by 1%, the quantity will change by less than 1%. So people are insensitive to changes in food of, in price because, well, first of all, food is about 10% of our budget. So it's pretty minimal. So even if you increase the price of food by 10%, it only makes a 1% difference in our overall budgets. If we look at an average mm -hmm. family. And we have that great diversity of food that makes it easy for us to substitute products. So if price of food goes up, Example, price of apples double will eat another food because we have plenty of other possibilities. Two years ago, you had cauliflowers that hit unprecedented prices. Well, my team will tell you that it's fine. We can stop buying cauliflower and everyone will be happy about it. And, and that's what most people did. And within two weeks, price of cauliflower went back down because there was all those substitutes that were available. Mm -hmm. I actually remember that quite well. I think my kids were celebrating as well. <laughs> um, so. I guess we have time for one more question. I'll, I'll, this one also I'll direct to you, uh, Professor Theriot. This one is, is quite a long question. I'll, I'll and sl question slash political statement, but let me throw it out there and maybe get your reaction to it. It comes from John and Norma Baxter. So they wrote that it seems to us that large food manufacturers and their investors have become fat on the backs of the very poorest in our collective societies. And it is way overdue that we redress the imbalance. Law-abiding law citizens have been mistreated by meat plant operators in the name of profit, and it is time they were paid at least minimum living wages, were offered improved working conditions, and were protected from exploitation by those who consume and demand cheap food at any price. Whether that means burning down rainforests, denying chickens and pigs sunlight, and propping the whole system up with antibiotics. Here's the question now. Has the time not come to treat sentient animals with more respect than ever before, and that includes our fellow human beings. That's an interesting statement. And th there are many points in that statement. Uh, and, and that vision is shared by other people also. 
what we see is that one aspect of globalization is that we can see what's happening everywhere in the world at all time. Uh, the situation in Canada is not perfect, but I, I think we have the benefit of having a very good situation compared to many other countries. The way we treat animals, the, the re environmental regulations we have, if you just look at Quebec farmers, for example, which I tend to work more with, uh, Quebec has some extremely strict environmental regulations to make sure that the, the levels of pollutions are minimal. And we have more family farms. And for small farmers, and that's true for all of Canada, if you look at smaller hog producers at, at our small family farm, dairy farms, for example, well, the way you treat animals will have a significant impact on how profitable you are. So there are no incentive for farmers to mistreat animals. A animals are up to a point close to what humans being, what human beings are. We will eat when we are in a comfortable setting, when we're in an optimal setting, when we're on the brink of dying or it's too hot, we don't feel like eating. So farmers do everything they can to make animals as comfortable as possible so that animals will want to eat, will feel like eating. Now, when it comes to antibiotics in food, uh, well, it, it, it's more Jennifer's field, but generally speaking, uh, those regulations have got much and much tighter. And in Canada, I think we can be proud of the system. We have chickens already antibiotic residue free. By 2020, it should be antibi completely antibiotic free, so no preemptive antibiotics being given. Now, for the, the labor part, uh, salaries in packing plant and slaughterhouses are actually relatively decent. And by relatively, I mean, well, you usually start around $15, $16 an hour to get all the way up to $22, $20, $24 an hour. For a low-skill job, it, it's still significant. Of course, the downside is it's not a fun job. As a student, I did spend one summer working in a packing plant that was over 20 years ago when I was making $15 an hour. I was pretty happy back then, but totally aware I would not be doing that for a living for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you for addressing that, um, taking that on. So before we wrap up, I just wanna throw maybe one final question out to each of you. Uh, I'll start with maybe, and this is sort of really looking sort of ahead post pandemic and sort of lessons that we've learned from this. So I'll start with you, Professor Ronholm, if that's okay. I know we've spoken a bit already about um, the fact that, you know, people uh, seem to be a bit more anxious about the food they're consuming, even if those fears are, are ultimately misplaced. Um, but do you think that post-pandemic, this anxiety around our food will stay with us and perhaps result in us being more cautious and more hygienic in how we shop for, prepare and consume our food? Or will these cautions evaporate once the threat of the coronavirus subsides? A couple questions there. Um... <laughs> I don't think that anxiety over food is ever a good thing. Food should be like a happy experience. I think if everyone takes a minute now to learn about proper kitchen hygiene, proper cooking techniques, and we can reduce our foodborne illnesses overall, that's a great thing. Um, but then like, let it go. Don't keep worrying about your food. It's pretty safe. Um, in terms of the changes we see in the world right now, I think when this pandemic is over, it'll the society will go back to normal. And I would wager to say in 15 or 20 years, most people won't remember that this happened. Um, obviously, there's no evidence behind that opinion. It's my own anecdotal evidence. But over the last couple of months, I found myself in conversation with a lot of people about the history of disease and the history of epidemics and pandemics. And there's no collective memory of what we've been through in the last century. In 2009, there was a huge H1N1 pandemic. Um, 1.4 billion people were infected. We don't seem to you know, remember that that happened. And at the same time in Yemen right now, we're having the biggest cholera outbreak that we've ever had in human history. Um, there's been 1.2 million cases. Um, 2,500 people, mostly under the age of five, has died, and not really many um, non-microbiologists realize that this is happening right now. That's not a bad thing. I don't think we should have that collective anxiety, um, but it's my evidence to say this will all go back to normal eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. And Professor Theriot, so I, maybe some parting words from you. I, I know that 
nobody's ever fully prepared for a large scale pandemic like this. But I'm wondering in your, from your perspective, um, if you think this crisis has underscored for you any weaknesses in our food production and food supply chains that were only one disaster away from being exposed. And, and do you think that this pandemic will serve as a wake up call and force us to rethink how our food gets from our farms and our factories uh, to our dinner plates? Well, the, the, the first answer I'll, tell, I'll give you is uh, many large food processors we have in Canada had business continuity plans in place and they, they were ready for potential crisis, but not to that scope. Uh, as a food processor, you're ready for food recalls, for potential machinery that would break or for input supplies that would be broken. But in, in that specific case, they were hit from within you're talking about actual employees that got sick and that completely stopped the system because input was there and there was demand for output so are we going to go toward a more 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 investments in technology more investments uh, more less reliance on humans that's a possibility that's something that we might be doing now for the, the second part for the wake-up call my, my greatest desire is that we as consumers that have lost touch with what food is and where food comes from, we get back in touch with all those aspects. We, we've seen a big rise in the gardens this year in Montreal. Uh, if you go to garden supply right now, there's nothing left anywhere. If you want to grow cucumbers this summer, it's too late for you because people are using that as a way to actually keep kids busy, let's face it. But uh, also, I think they, they're they trying to look back at their own food supply and how food is produced. And I, I think that's a great thing because once you will have spent one summer trying to grow your own garden, you will understand what it involves to grow food. And I think it will bring more respect to food itself and the work that's put into farmers to that kept producing, we talked about health workers as essential workers, rightfully so, that kept healing people, that kept working out. Farmers have not stopped working either and, and they're facing the challenges. And there we had to go through some roadblocks to get some food on the shelves in the short run, but our food supply system never stopped and it just adapted to the current situation. Mm -hmm. Great. But I think you underscored the point I made earlier in, in the introduction that, you know, any way you look at it, I think this pandemic has, has really forced us to think about our relationship with food in, in, in many new ways. So, so thank you for, for those closing remarks for both of you. Um, so that does uh, wrap up uh, the time we do have for today. Uh, before we close, I would like to remind you that this video will be available at this very same link soon after our recording ends. So feel free to share it with others who may have not been able to tune in live or watch it again, as I'm sure I will as well. Um, and please keep watching your email and social media feeds for more opportunities through this series and through other webinars offered by McGill's alumni relations team to learn about how McGill is confronting the challenges of COVID-19 and keeping you informed with insight from our academic, medical, and even food experts. If you are a McGill graduate who is not currently receiving our emails but would like to be added to our distribution list, you can do so by visiting alumni.mcgill.ca slash register. The link will be available beneath the video player on our YouTube channel as well. And of course, a big thank you to our two guests from McGill's McDonald campus and our Faculty of Agricultural and Environmental Sciences, Professors Jennifer, Jennifer Ronholm and Pascal Theriot, for sharing such great information with us today. You've certainly given me quite a bit to think about as I head up to my kitchen now to grab some lunch. Uh, and if you enjoyed uh, this topic and want to be part of the exciting research taking place around food and COVID-19, there is a great way to do so without gaining a single calorie. Please consider taking part in a brand new online study being run out of our McDonald campus. It's the COVID-19 Quebec Food Shopping Survey led by Professor Daiva Nielsen at our School of Human Nutrition. And it's designed to assess the impact of the pandemic on household grocery shopping patterns in order to better inform food access strategies in future public health emergencies. If it's research and if it's happening, then it's probably happening at McGill. You can access the survey at mcgill.ca slash COVID food study. And please note that the survey is open to Quebec residents aged 18 and over. Finally, I invite you to join us again next Thursday for a really special treat when I sit down for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with renowned McGill business professor, Henry Mintzberg. 
Several years ago, Professor Mintz Mintzberg published a book entitled Rebalancing Societies, in which he outlined his concerns around how our societies were spiraling in a direction that was destroying our democracies, our planet, and ourselves. The COVID-19 pandemic has put many of his theories to the test much sooner than we would have ever imagined. This promises to be a highly engaging discussion with a McGill legend who is not known for holding his opinions to himself. Until then, please stay safe, be well, and remember to wash those fruits and veggies well, but not with Lysol. And I hope to see you back here next week. Thank you. <laughs>